Hello, everyone, and welcome to the closing plenary of this year's Canadian Military History Colloquium. Moderating our closing address is Dr. Jeffrey Hayes of the University of Waterloo. Jeff, the stage is yours. Thanks, Matt. Uh, it would not be a, uh, a Laurier Colloquium without a plenary talk by, by Terry Kopp, one of Canada's best known military historians and who really is the founder of this gathering that we always look forward to every year. Uh, he started this colloquium way back when, I can't even remember when, back in the early 90s through the center that he created and uh, in the Laurier Center for Military Strategic and Disarmament Studies. He was also at that time, the founding editor of Canadian Military History, a journal that continues to produce great work from new generations of scholars, which is just as Terry intended. Terry's books are well known to all of us, I'm sure. The Maple Leaf Root series with Robert Vogel, The Brigade, uh, Battle Exhaustion with uh, Bill McAndrew, uh, various other works that he has done, including Fields of Fire and Cinderella Army, all of which are now considered classics. You'll probably get mad at me for calling them classics, but there you are. His battlefield guides of the Canadians have led thousands of Canadians, including I'm sure many of those who are watching today on their own tours, their own tours of discovery of Northwest Europe and Italy. And they have, of course, helped raise the profile of the Canadian armies in Italy and in France, Belgium, the Netherlands, and of course, Germany. Now, some might not know this, but before Terry was a military historian, he was a social historian, particularly centered in the town he grew up in, Montreal. His book, The Anatomy of Poverty, published in 1974 by McClellan Stewart, is, I'm going to use the word again, another classic study of the city that examines the impact particularly of massive economic growth through the first 30 years of the 20th century, particularly on the working people of Montreal. It was uh, uh, and remains still is a remarkable piece of work. Terry's latest book is again, most of us know Montreal at War 1914-1918 with Alec Mavara, which is in the UTP catalog for publication in early 2022 is then a, a kind of return back to Montreal's roots for Terry. And so it uh, is neat to kind of follow the trajectory of Terry's many interests and curiosities. Any of us who have heard Terry talk or read his books over the years will admire his remarkable energy and his intellectual curiosity. His talk today on public opinion in Montreal during the Spanish Civil War is further evidence of his ability to take us in new and provocative directions. Terry, the floor is yours. Thank you again. Well, thank you, Jeff. And uh, thanks to the organizers, Matt Baker and Britt Dunn. And special thanks to those of you who stayed to hear this last session. My paper today is based on sections of a work in progress on Montreal in the last years of the Depression, and especially the Second World War. It's modeled on Montreal at War 1914-1918, which the University of Toronto Press, as Jeff says, will be publishing in February of 2022. My interest in Bethune and the context within which he acted dates back to the 1970s and a graduate seminar on Montreal history I taught at Concordia University. In those days, students wrote a series of papers on many aspects of the city in the 1930s, including Harvey Levinson, whose work on the Spanish Civil War in Montreal I reread recently. I might say Harvey's MA thesis uh, is available online through Concordia University. The story of Bethune and the Bishop was also influenced by my participation in a conference organized for the 40th anniversary of the death of Norman Bethune. The conference held at McGill University in 1979 attracted a wide variety of spectators, including a large number who wished to celebrate the life of a revolutionary hero and those who were interested in placing Bethune within the context of his times. 
My presentation back in 1979 was called The Health of the People, Montreal in the Depression Years, and it barely mentioned Bethune, focusing instead on efforts to improve public health and especially the relative success of the ongoing struggle to reduce the rate of infant mortality, which had made Montreal one of the unhealthiest cities in the Western world. In the new manuscript, Bethune's Montreal story is preceded by an overview of the economic, social, and cultural life of the city, which was mired in the Great Depression. And I wanna to begin today with a very brief sketch of that reality before presenting different reactions to the outbreak of the Spanish Civil War. When the depression began, just over 900,000 people lived in the city, roughly 200,000 households. Just 40% were part of the paid labor force, even during the prosperity years of the late 1920s. And this always included large numbers who were regularly unemployed during the winter months when the river froze and the harbor closed. Now in the 30s, despite much talk about the virtues of rural life and a government-sponsored colonization movement, migration to the city continued throughout every year. And by 1936, more than a million people lived in Montreal, Canada's metropolis. In 1933, the worst year of the depression, one third of the labor force was unemployed. And by 1936, the numbers had only fallen to one in four. Municipal relief in 1936 provided a family of five with $10 a week less than half the amount the Department of Labor thought was necessary for the most basic standard of living. To better understand this and what it meant for daily life, you might want to read Denise Bayarjol's Making Do, an account of women, family, and the home in Montreal during the Great Depression, which was published in translation by Wilfrid Laurier University Press. Montreal in the 1930s was an ethnically diverse, residentially segregated city. Just over 60% of the population were French Canadian, 27% Anglo Celtic, and 13% made up of Jews, Italians, Ukrainians, and other largely European nationalities. A small Chinatown, and a black district in the area known as Little Burgundy added to the complexity. The indigenous population of the area concentrated at Kanawaki near Montreal was just over 2,000 with, according to the 1941 census, just 205 living on the island of Montreal. Throughout the 1930s, newspapers and radio broadcasts provided Canadians with detailed reports on world events. They were based on dispatches from the international news services rather than overseas reporters, and they were for the most part straight factual accounts. For Montrealers with multiple daily newspapers, as well as five radio stations, events like the Japanese conquest of Manchuria, the rise of Hitler, his anti-Semitic measures, including the Nuremberg Laws, the Italian invasion of Ethiopia in 1935, and the occupation of the Rhineland by Hitler's army in March of 1936, were all seen as important but distant events of little direct concern to the population. The outbreak of the Spanish Civil War in July 1936 evoked a much stronger reaction, at least in Montreal, where Catholics supported Franco's crusade to overthrow the public from the very first day. Chronology is one of the most important and abused tools available to historians. And I think we should note that in the summer and fall of 1936, Canadians chose sides on the Spanish Civil War 
on their basis, on the basis of their attitudes towards the Soviet Union, the common turn, and the Communist Party's 1935 decision <coughs> to endorse popular front movements uniting the left. For Catholics, nationalist claims that the Republic had plunged Spain into a civil war because it was controlled by atheistic communists were readily accepted. In Montreal, French Canadian, Irish, and Italian clerics, as well as most of their laymen, endorsed this anti-communist crusade before detailed reports of the Red Terror directed at priests and nuns were available. The large majority of Montreal's English-speaking population, Protestant and Jewish, were indifferent or neutral with regard to Spain. All three English language dailies supported the British-sponsored non-intervention agreement of August, September 36, and the weekly Jewish Chronicle ignored the issue entirely, focusing on Palestine and the plight of the Jews in Poland and Germany. There were individuals in all communities who rallied to the Republican cause, but active Canadian support for the Loyalists was, in 1936, largely confined to Communist Party members motivated by the view that the Republic was anti-fascist and pro-Soviet. Outside of communist circles, it was clear no one was talking about a future war with Hitler's Germany. The fear was what Hitler might do to the Soviet Union. The most prominent or best known activist in Montreal was Dr. Norman Bethieu, a great war veteran and a thoracic surgeon of considerable reputation. Bethune, however, was not universally admired in Montreal, either by his medical colleagues or fellow activists. Edward Archibald, Bethune's supervisor at the Royal Victoria Hospital, described Bethune's surgery as, quote, quick, rough, untidy, and a little dangerous. The hospital was losing patients operated on by Dr. Bethune at an unusual rate. Bethune denied the relevance of this, insisting that his rate of failures was a consequence of the more serious he cases, cases he took on, and the question is essentially unanswerable. But we do know that Bethune found a more congenial environment at Sacre Coeur Hospital in 1933 and remained there as the head of thoracic surgery until he left for Spain. Bethune, like so many other romantic radicals of the 30s, visited the Soviet Union, ready to be impressed with what officials chose to show him. On his return to Montreal, he joined the Communist Party and organized a Montreal group for the security of the people's health. They collectively drafted a manifesto and sent it to the provincial political parties before the 1936 provincial election. When the civic authorities created an unemployment medical relief commission in 1936, which offered doctors 25 cents per patient visit, most of Bethune's group volunteered their service. And Bethune was left angry and isolated. That was the mood when he learned of a plan to send a Canadian medical aid mission to Spain. Now the North American Committee to Aid Spanish Democracy was an openly communist party organization. But in Canada, the CCF, which had previously resisted the Open Front, the United Front or cooperation with the CPC was involved from the beginning. Bethune was invited to Toronto and offered the leadership of the proposed mission to Spain. He was to participate in a mass meeting to raise money on the project. And the Toronto committee invited a delegation from the Spanish Republic, who were currently touring the United States, to be the main attraction in Toronto. The delegation included a Franciscan priest from the Basque country which was Catholic, but loyal to the Republic. 
something that caused the Vatican considerable difficulty. American Franciscans, however, every bit as anti-communist as their counterparts in Canada, condemned Father Sarasola's participation and claimed he was an apostate outside the authority of the church. This did not matter in Protestant Toronto, the Belfast of Canada, but when arrangements for a similar meeting in Montreal were announced, the archdiocese immediately declared that Sarasola did not speak for the Franciscans or for the church and warned Catholics to avoid him. Indeed, the local provincial of the Franciscan order in Quebec published a public letter urging Sarasola not to participate in any meeting in Montreal. Now in Montreal, the chief of the Montreal Committee to Aid Spanish Democracy was F.R. Frank Scott, a McGill law professor and co-author of the CCF's Rejoinder Manifesto. Scott was by no means yet the civil rights icon he would become defending the Jehovah Witnesses and winning the case against Quebec's Padlock Act. Indeed, in 1936, he was best known as the son of Canon Frederick Scott, the chaplain of First Division in the Great War, and a person who was very much a hero to Canadians across the country. Scott, who was to become a close friend of a group of French Canadian nationalists, when they both supported, when they all supported uh, neutrality in 1939, seems to have had little contact with French Canadians in 1936. And he was apparently unaware that the meeting he scheduled for 23 October in Montreal was to take place on the weekend that the city's Catholics were preparing for the festival of Christ the King. Pope Pius XI had added this feast or event to the church's liturgical calendar in 1925, and it was wholly embraced in Montreal and Quebec by the church. Thousands were expected to gather to participate in what was described in the Catholic newspapers and daily newspapers as a great Catholic manifestation. The day before the Spanish delegation arrived, Scott heard rumors that students and Catholic activists planned to wreck his meeting. He called the director of police seeking assistance, but was met instead with open hostility. Montreal police chief Dufresne reported is a Catholic city. Scott did not know what he was doing in holding such a meeting, the director declared. After 300 students marched to City Hall, a delegation entered the chambers and the mayor decided to cancel the permit to use the Mount Royal Arena where the meeting was scheduled to take place. The police were given full powers and decided not to intervene with the planned demonstration so long as the demonstrators were peaceful. Attempts to hold a meeting at Victoria Hall in West End, English-speaking Westmount, or at a downtown hotel, were foiled by crowds parading through the streets, shouting, down with the communists. Apart from an invitation-only luncheon at McGill, neither Bethune nor the Spaniards got to speak in Montreal, and the delegation caught the night train back to New York City. Scott issued a statement the next day that read, the delegates did not come as exponents of any political theory, but simply as Democrats to state the case for their democratically elected government. A bit naive, perhaps. It is true, if it is true, Scott said, that such a meeting could not have been held in Montreal without rioting, then the Montreal police were justified in banning it. But Canadian democracy is in a precarious condition. 
if a sane and considered statement for a lawful government is prevented from being given in a British country by threats of violence from irresponsible elements. These irresponsible elements included Bishop Georges Gautier, who departed from his sermon text at Sunday's Feast of Christ the King to declare war on communism and tell the crowd that filled the square and adjacent streets as far as the eye could see, Catholics, your day has come. Newspapers estimated the audience for the 1936 feast at 100,000. Whatever the number, the visit of the Spanish delegation had turned a religious holiday into a mass demonstration of Catholic solidarity and anti-communism. Frank Scott and other activists, CCF and CCP, continued to organize meetings and raise funds for the Republic. In January 1938, a new model parliament at McGill debated a resolution condemning the democratic nations for the betrayal of Spain through their support for the non-intervention agreement. David Lewis, a McGill grad and Rhodes scholar who had returned to Canada to become the national secretary of the CCF, acted as prime minister. It proved difficult to find speakers for the negative within McGill. And when students from the University of Montreal arrived, it was clear they were there to stage a demonstration and not to engage in a debate. By then, Bethune was in Spain, organizing a mobile blood transfusion unit. Unfortunately, Conflict with the divided authorities, an alcohol-fueled explosive temper, and a liaison with a woman whose loyalty the, to the Republic was in question, created a crisis for Bethune, which Ted Allen, a Canadian serving with the International Brigade, was required to solve. Allen served as political commissar, those are his words, not mine, for the Canadians in Spain, and he decided to send Bethune home after just four months. Bethune's mission now was to raise funds in a cross-Canada tour. Bethune hated every bit of the task and soon left Canada for the last time to join the communist forces resisting the Japanese aggression in Northern China. He joined Mao Zedong and the Eighth Root Army establishing a reputation as both a frontline surgeon and a teacher mentor to the Chinese. He died, as we know, in 1939 from an infection suffered during an operation. Few details about Bethune's time in Spain are available, in China, pardon me, are available, but a letter he wrote to Hazen Size in August of 1938, describes a day in which he reported that he had performed 10 operations, five of them serious. He continued that he was happy doing important work, and he said, I am needed. More than that, he wrote, to satisfy my bourgeois vanity, the need for me is expressed. My own house, my own personal servant, my cook, I have no money or need of it. I have the fortune to be among and to work among comrades to whom communism is a way of life, not merely a way of talking. After his death, Mao wrote the essay In Memory of Northern Bethune, establishing Bethune's reputation and importance for China and for the revolution to come in the 1940s. Canadian newspapers noted Bethune's death, but they were in the midst of their own war in November 1939, and in the case of Montreal, dealing with the after effects of the provincial election, which saw the defeat of Maurice de Plessis and a renewed commitment to a war without conscription. Le Devoir published a two inch long obituary 
while the Montreal Star's obituary claimed that the politics behind wars mean nothing, meant nothing to Bethune. This would have infuriated Norman Bethune, who wanted to be identified as a communist revolutionary. <clears throat> Apart from Ted Allen's book, The Scalpel and the Sword, published in 1952 as an attempt to counter Cold War anti-communism, Bethune was a minor footnote in Canadian history. Minor, that is, until Pierre Trudeau established diplomatic relations with mainland China in 1970. Suddenly, historians and journalists discovered Bethune, publishing articles and books, creating films, unveiling statues, and popularizing his story to promote Canadian-Chinese relations. Canada's Department of External Affairs purchased Bethune's birthplace in Gravenhurst, and it was turned into a National Historic Site in 1974. Bethune was now portrayed as an authentic Canadian humanitarian and hero, his memory deployed to foster better trade and promote tourism with China. As a personal aside, I recall the transformation of public opinion and government policy after 1970 very clearly. I knew the experience of my colleague at McGill, Paul Lynn, who joined the history department to teach East Asian history in 1964, the same year I began teaching at McGill. Paul and his wife, Eileen, were committed to educating Canadians about China defending every aspect of policy, including the occupation of Tibet, the One China Doctrine, and to a degree, the Cultural Revolution. Paul and I became friends, partly due to our participation in anti-Vietnam war teachings, and partly simply as we had offices next to each other. I remember attending the funeral of his son, Christopher, who was killed in an automobile accident in 1966. Paul thought that the accident might have been caused by the Chinese nationalists or the CIA. And his suspicions could be explained, at least to us, by the continued harassment directed him by both Canadian and especially American authorities when he traveled. After the election of Trudeau in 1968, Paul's situation began to change dramatically. He became an unofficial advisor to, to, to Trudeau, helping prepare the ground for the recognition of communist China. In the 1970s, Paul became a highly respected and much sought after figure in Canadian academia and important as well in the United States where he served as a liaison between Henry Kissinger and the Chinese in the run up to Nixon's visit. He, like Bethune, became an important person in Canada, eventually being awarded and made a member of the Order of Canada. Today, under very different circumstances, the Bethune card seems to have little value in our relations with China. And regrettably, Paul is not around to help smooth things over. All of us who knew him miss him very much. I have no quarrel with the received version of the Bethune story, even as updated by Adrienne Clarkson in her biography for the Extraordinary Canadian series, which certainly emphasizes the humanitarian rather than the political side of Bethune's personality. No quarrel, so long as we understand that the life of Bethune tells, tells us almost nothing about the Spanish Civil War or the Sino-Japanese conflict, and not much more about Montreal in the 1930s. Bishop George, George Gautier, Bethune's antagonist in 1936, presided over the Archdiocese of Montreal for 20 years. And his activities can tell us a great deal about life in Montreal. He has, however, been largely ignored by historians. There is a hagiography published shortly after his death in 1940, a brief biographical sketch in the Dictionary of Canadian Biography, passing reference in Jean-Lin and Nicole Gagnon's 
History of Quebec Catholicism. And Michael Govro's book, The Catholic Origins of the Quebec Revolution, makes at least, of the Quiet Revolution, makes at least passing reference to him. Only passing reference, perhaps because the bishop was so clearly striving to create what was called a new Middle Ages, rather than trying to keep Catholicism at the center of a secularizing Quebec state. Cochet's relative lack of interest in Quebec nationalism may help to explain why contemporary Quebec historians ignore him. Abbe Lionel Gru, Andre Laurendeau, and other nationalists can be celebrated for what, there's, what is called their dream of nation. But Gautier rests in obscurity. His Laurentian home became a tourist inn, not a national historic site. Born in Montreal in 1871, ordained in 1894, after doctoral studies in Rome and a series of important appointments in the Archdiocese of Montreal, Gauthier was made auxiliary bishop with right of succession to the Montreal Archdiocese in 1918. When Archbishop Bruchesi succumbed to dementia the following year, Gauthier administered the Archdiocese until his death in 1940. Described by his DC biographer, Denise Robillard, as a studious, reflective, and highly cultivated man with the gift of a vibrant voice that helped to make him a powerful, effective, and convincing speaker, Gauthier was involved in most aspects of Montreal's religious, cultural, and social life. Perhaps we should remind ourselves that during the first half of the 20th century, Organized religion played a much larger role in society than it does today. For French Canadians, frequent, if not regular attendance at mass, children educated in clerically controlled schools with extensive religious indoctrination, relatives or friends who were members of religious orders, hospitals, welfare institutions, colleges and universities owned and operated by the clergy, Obviously, all of this influenced the society. Even in Montreal, where a 60 hour work week, family responsibilities, and the temptations of a large city dominant daily life, the influence of the church is wholly understandable. Like other religious leaders, Protestant and Catholic, Gauthier used the pulpit to admonish people to avoid the activities which Montrealers so very much enjoyed. During American prohibition in the 1920s, Montreal had become an open city, or perhaps even more an open city, with every entertainment and vice imaginable on display. Persuading people to avoid bars, nightclubs, dance halls, racetracks, vulgar American movies, immoral plays from France, and the city's notorious red light district proved difficult, but as Bishop, Gauthier had to try. On broader social questions, Gauthier followed Pope Pius XI's 1931 encyclical Quadragesimo Anno, which restated in more detailed terms the ideas expressed in the 1891 encyclical Rerum Novarum, the foundation of Catholic social doctrine. Pius added a specific condemnation of communism to the earlier critique of socialism and liberalism before outlining a social order based on cooperation between labor and capital, employer and employee. For Pius, private prop property was legitimate, but ownership and the use of property and capital were separate issues. A male worker, the Pope insisted, must be paid a wage sufficient to support his family. Paid employment for women and children was to be avoided. The best way of achieving this was through the development of guild-like syndicates, uniting workers and owners to pursue the common good. Strikes and lockouts would be unnecessary and forbidden. Gauthier endorsed all of this, including opposition to the extension of the franchise to women. And in a 1934 pastoral letter, 
occasioned by the formation of the CCF with its pledge to eradicate capitalism, Gauthier forbid Catholics to join the new party as, quote, socialism was the precursor of communism. There were, however, other sides to Gauthier. As the first rector of the newly independent University of Montreal, freed from the control of Laval University, he transformed the institution, previously dedicated the education of priests, lawyers, and doctors into a modern university. Faculties of science, veterinary medicine, philosophy detached from theology, and a school of social science, economics, and political science directed by Edouard Montpetit, the first lay person to lead a university faculty in a Quebec Catholic environment. Later, as university chancellor, Gauthier led the campaign to build a new campus on the north slope of Mount Royal. Construction got underway in 1928 but neither church nor state nor private philanthropy was able to fund the ambitious project in the 1930s. The partially completed campus did not open until 1943, two years after Gauthier's death. Gauthier also led efforts to improve secondary education for French speaking Catholics. High schools for English Protestants and English Catholic students provided entry to the workforce or university, but in French-speaking Quebec, access to the university was a monopoly of the classical colleges. The superior primary schools, Gauthier encouraged for 14 to 16-year-olds, provided a general education for entry into commerce, industry, public service, and agriculture. Unfortunately, the depression curbed the expansion of the program which required fees and more importantly, kept teenagers from earning money for family needs during the depression. Gauthier, more importantly, was directly responsible for the introduction of the Jacquistes, the Jeunesse Ouvrier Catholique to Montreal. Father Henri Roy, an oblate worker priest, was asked to build a Quebec version of the young Christian worker movement which began in Belgium in the 1920s before spreading to France and other Catholic countries. The idea was to encourage young people from working class parishes to join together in concrete actions to assist parishioners and counter the appeal of communist and secular ideas. On your screen, one of the issues of the Jeunesse Ouvrier, the Journal Jacquiste, their nickname, is simply uh, saying uh, congratulations to itself as the numbers of jockeys involved in activities has grown so steadily in the province. Father Roy proved to be a charismatic leader who quickly established female and male groups, female first, interestingly enough, in the city's East End. The Jockeys monthly magazine presented the standard messages of religious observance and the menace of communism but most of its pages were devoted to publicizing activities. Jockey's members visited prisons, developed a cloth and food store for unemployed, created a placement service, a free dental clinic, and pioneered summer camps for the unemployed. In 1935, Father Roy, convinced of the need to better educate young Catholics in their faith, prepared a paperback version of the New Testament that sold half a million copies at 25 cents each. The success of the Jacquistes, who attracted far more participants than the better known nationalist movements, encouraged Gauthier to import a second specialized Catholic action organization, Young Catholic Students, Jeunesse Etudant Catholique, to the city. He assigned the task to the Fathers of the Holy Cross, bypassing the Jesuits and their long established Catholic Youth of those Association, Association Catholique Jeunesse Canadienne, or ACJC. Both organizations focused on Catholic action, not nationalism, 
drawing the ire of Abbe Lionel Gru and other Quebec nationalists. Gauthier tried to effect a compromise, placing the new groups under the nominal control of the ACJC, but this had no effect on their activities. By 1939, more than 40,000 men and women participated in jockey's groups, most famously in a mass wedding of 100 couples married simultaneously in Delormier Stadium, the home of the Montreal Royals. There's a video of this event online if you're interested. In the summer of 1936, the worst of the depression appeared to be over in what proved to be a very brief recovery. The major news in Montreal that summer was the election in August that brought Maurice Duplessis in the temporary guise of a reformer to power. The civil war in Spain, which began in July, only intruded onto the front pages in September when Franco's nationalist forces began the siege of Madrid. By mid-October, the fall of Madrid was thought to be imminent. And on October 21st, Le Devoir published a front page editorial outlining a report of attacks on clerical institutions by partisans of the Republic. The article was based on one of the first detailed reports issued by the Vatican. There was as yet no confirmation of rumors of the murder of hundreds and priests and nuns, but the story with less dramatic details still shocked Catholics. When the Spanish delegation arrived in Montreal on the morning of 23rd October, the French language press in Montreal was in full cry. La Patrie, the populist conservative daily, placed a question mark at the end of a headline which read, a riot at the arena tonight? Coverage of the student action at City Hall, when 300 young men and women arrived, was positive, indeed encouraging. And after a raucous night of street demonstrations, which prevented the Spanish delegation from speaking, the French language press described the action as an anti-communist manifestation carried out by the population which had paraded through the streets of Montreal. No rioters were observed in the French press. The next day, a crowd said to number 100,000 gathered to hear Goche, as well as civic leaders, condemn communism and celebrate a great Catholic manifestation. Catholic, your day has come, you remember Goche said. Conflict between Catholic organizations and the Montreal to aid, Committee to Aid Spanish Democracy continued when Bethune returned from Spain and on, and on other occasions. On my screen, a photograph from Le Canada, the liberal newspaper of the crowds at the Champ des Mars uh, for Gauthier's speech is demonstrated, uh, hoping to try and establish just how powerful this all was. Um, but, sorry, let me begin again. Conflict between Catholic organizations and the Montreal Committee to Aid Spanish Democracy continued when Bethune returned from Span Spain and other occasions but the international situation changed dramatically in 1938 with the annexation of Austria, the Munich Agreement, and above all, Kristallnacht, which in Montreal, as well as Toronto and elsewhere in Canada, united citizens in fear and loathing of Nazi Germany. By late 1938, Spain was no longer the dominant issue and largely disappeared from the news. What might we learn from this attempt to understand the context of the clash between Bethune and the bishop? At a minimum, we can surely agree that the kind of presentism that turned Bethune into a Canadian hero in the 1970s poses a challenge to our understanding of the past. Researching and writing in a silo with concrete walls protects us from complexity but distorts history, often to advance agendas. 
we might also wish to reflect upon the ideological debates of the 1930s, understanding that the fundamental problem confronting Canadians was the lack of external demand for our principal exports, wheat and newsprint, which accounted for most of our foreign exchange and for the survival of the prairie economy. The collapse in demand impacted the overbuilt and debt-laden railway system and reduced traffic through a harbor like Montreal's by more than 50%. Demand for domestically produced manufacturers declined rapidly, creating mass urban unemployment. Government revenue and profits declined sharply. None of the political agendas on offer in the 30s address these issues. The Communist Party of Canada, a loyal Stalinist organization, had nothing to offer except a quasi-religious belief that life was better in the Soviet Union. The Regina Manifesto, with its promise to eradicate capitalism, nationalize railways and banks, and much else, was equally irrelevant to the economic crisis of the time. Pre-Keynesian parsimony, the solution of liberal and conservative leaders, offered no hope and no help. In this context, Catholic social doctrine urging cooperation and a living wage may not have been the absolutely worst option. One last thought, and then perhaps there may be questions. We all know that events may not be caused or influenced by events that have not yet taken place. But too often in practice, we are, allow our knowledge of the future to determine our view of the past. The thoughts behind the actions, to use Collingwood's phrase, of individuals in 1936 were not based on the belief that the Second World War was about to begin, or begin in three years, or that war-induced demand would transform the economy. They had to act on the basis of what they knew and what they believed at the time. Surely it's our job historians, as historians, our primary job as historians, to understand them before we offer judgments. Thank you. Thanks so much, Terry. I think I'm on. There we are. We'll, um... You're always coming back to R.G. Collingwood, aren't you? Well, as I said, most important book I ever read, most influential book I ever read. <laughs> so there's a, there's a few lessons here. Um, we've got a few questions, and I've got a few too. Uh, Terry always reminds me that I'm a Southern Ontario Anglo-Baptist who has no understanding at all of French Canada when I first took that class from you. But I was struck, you know, when we, when we talk about the 1930s, and just to go back to your point about who gets remembered, uh, and Bishop Gautier probably deserves more attention than, than, he, uh, than he receives on the basis of what you've told us. But your, your point is a good one, obviously, about how we look back on the present and look back on the past and fi find people and events that are useful to our present. So in the 1970s, Bethune, although as somebody pointed out, I think it was Donald Britton who first did a, uh, uh, bio or a film treatment of Bethune in the 60s, I would think through the NFB. Um, but you know, in your classes, I learned about uh, Maurice Duplessis, Camille Hood, the mayor of Montreal through the 1930s, who of course would be interned over conscription. And then the other major political or religious figure in Montreal, which eclipses Gauthier, I guess, is Brother Andre. Eh? I mean, I'm just trying to understand who would be understood or remembered from that period. Well, Gauthier was a strong supporter of Brother Andre and the development of the shrine, uh, St. Joseph's, yeah. on the mountain. Um, I thought for a while of including some reference to it, but Gauthier was a, was a supporter, not not one who uh, uh, was responsible in any way for Brother Andre's life and work. So it just didn't fit with the, uh, with the action. Yeah. On the more general question, I guess I wanted to do this paper and I wanted to stress the, uh, the life of Gauthier. I could have picked other people. 
uh, because Montreal, like other cities in Canada, no doubt, but Montreal more than most, uh, was a, what is a very complex environment. And when historians cut into that complexity and, for example, remove for all practical purposes, the existence of the history of the Jewish and Protestant community from the historical record, um, I think I'm entitled to be a bit alarmed. You may recall that I uh, served uh, for the Montreal English Speaking School Board as a historian consultant on the new Quebec curriculum uh, and wrote a detailed report which uh, suggested that the unwillingness of the curriculum, which was clearly institu instituted under a uh, uh, Pekis government, uh, to even mention uh, prominent Anglos like, say, Darcy McGee or uh, Alexander Tillich Galt, or to address the question of institution building, or to address the role of the Jewish community, Italian community, or other communities in Montreal in a way that allowed their li lives and their experience to be part of Montreal's story. Uh, this is, of course, what is. Uh, what has led me in both Montreal War 1914-18 and in the new book to um, keep remembering that I want to talk about everyone in the city that I can, uh, can find uh, relevant information about. Uh, I, I'm mindful of a couple of questions, but this one just ties in. I'll come back to your question, Dave Alexander, in a second. Uh, Mike Boire is asking, to, to your point about who is in Montreal? What were the most active Scots Irish Jewish charities in Depression Montreal? Well, Montreal, in terms of private charities, was organized strictly on religious lines. So there is a, a Protestant uh, welfare pro uh, predecessor to the United Way organization, one for English Catholics, one for French Catholics, a number for Jews, but a centralized collection of the general appeal type was there. Um, Italians operated, we're only talking about a relatively small Italian population in the 1930s, 20,000. Uh, they had their own organizations, uh, which uh, were certainly necessary because Italian unemployment during the 1930s probably exceeded that of both Anglos and French Canadians uh, because they had been particularly associated with work on the railways and railway shops, and that practically closed down as an industry in Montreal. Sure, sure. Um, Dave Alexander, who comes from Owen Sound, and they pride themselves that Norman Bethune is, I think, uh, on their wall of remembrance in the high school. And if I remember, Dave, correct me if I'm wrong, you can send me a note that he's credited with being one of the first uh, uh, soldiers, well, soldiers, is that the right phrase? But I, it's as if they didn't quite know what to do with Norman Bethune in Owen Sound High School. So he's credited with being one of the first ca fatal casualties of the Second World War, which of course isn't really true. So it's it's part of that problem pre-1970 of knowing what to do with, Beth with Bethune, even in his own communities. Bethune, or well, I'll finish the question from, from uh, Dave. Is Bethune simply running out of life and career choices in Canada once he departs for Spain? Well, I think the answer to that is very close to yes. I think that uh, he was uh, starting to get into trouble with the um, church-run Sacre Coeur Hospital, uh, although uh, he certainly was highly respected there and it said that the nuns who ran Sacre Coeur uh, continued to use his methods and use some films they'd taken of his operating techniques. But um, Bethune's uh, communism in a Catholic society certainly uh, raised questions. And even if we did not know publicly that he was a party member in 1936, he certainly talked in a way uh, that would uh, make it difficult to continue for very long at Sacre Coeur. Um, I don't know how alienated he was from other left-wing activists in Montreal um, in a sense, the stories that we know best about Bethune are stories of a man with a charismatic personality that dominated any room he entered into, but his arrogance and his willingness to put people down, even people who were his friends, 
and his unsparing criticism of people who deviated from what Bethune thought was the right course of action um, created a, an atmosphere in Montreal which made it likely that going to Spain and then when he couldn't stay in Spain, partly for the same kind of personality reasons, uh, it, it made um, China the next um, possibility. I want to be careful because I think it's important. People who knew Bethune admired him enormously, even when he made them very uncomfortable and indeed angry. Uh, he was a person who translated thought into action. And uh, sometimes that meant blundering ahead in a way that was hurtful to other people. Uh, but he was an activist, uh, not a, a philosopher king. Um, Joel Montan has a question. He, he raises the point that David Bergeson has argued that there's an appeal to Vichy uh, in Francophone Catholic society in Quebec due to Vichy's revival of Catholicism in France. <laughs> okay, I, I first remember yeah, the question is all about the future for 1936. Uh, I think that, uh, that uh, elements within French Canadian society were deeply, profoundly shocked by the fall of France in 1940, as indeed were many other people around the world. In some senses for English speaking Canadians and certainly for French Canadians, the Second World War started not with the invasion of Poland and the declaration of war, but with the fall of France, which transformed events into something that seemed so serious, previous ideas about international relations no longer mattered. Even Frank Scott began to shut up about neutral, neutrality uh, in the aftermath of the um, uh, fall of France. So the arrival of Pétain and uh, Vichy with a, a Catholic social order rhetoric uh, certainly soothed feelings in Quebec. On the other hand, as I will demonstrate, as I did demonstrate in the text of, uh, of uh, Montreal at War 1914-18, and I will again demonstrate in the chapter on recruiting in Quebec during the Second World War, large numbers of French Canadians, both before and after the fall of France, joined the Canadian Army, or tried to, tried to join the Royal Canadian Air Force, although when a French Canadian joined the Royal Canadian Air Force, all he could really hope to do is go to school to learn English because there was no way that the Royal Canadian Air Force was going to take a unilingual francophone or even one whose French was limited. And so schools were created in Quebec City and other centers around the province, as I said, primarily to bring French Canadian volunteers up to a usable level of English. The army was different because there were French Canadian battalions where limited ability to speak English was a handicap, but not uh, something that prevented you from joining. So yes, Vichy attracted appeal uh, for uh, French Canadians in a, in a particular context. Right, right. Um, a few other questions here that we'll touch on before our time is done. Uh, the religious orders, Leo Devo wants to know about, uh, such as the Jesuits, did they align with Gautier's interests? And what was the take of some of the orders about Bethune? Well, the Jesuit question is, of course, a, a very difficult one because, as I, as I always try and argue, I, I taught at Loyola for six years and know there is no such thing as the Jesuits. Uh, Jesuit fathers are different from each other in so many ways. They may have some, some similarity in terms of the discipline they accept and the vows they take, but as personalities and as people with political ideas, they very greatly. But what one can say is that the, um, the Jesuits were the driving force behind the Association Catholique Jeunesse Canadienne, uh, the École Sociale Populaire, and many other openly, devotedly nationalist movements. Uh, it's also clear that the Jesuits were unhappy with the Oblates and with the Fathers of the Holy Cross and the prominent role Gauthier gave them in leading the Jacquist and Jacquist, which is Jeunesse Etudant Catholique, uh, the student movement um, that was started by, uh, uh, started when Gauthier authorized and encouraged it to come into existence. 
But um, I wouldn't be able to go further than that for the simple reason that there may have been many Jesuits who um, uh, were uh, supporters of Goche and all of them, of course, accepted his Episcopal authority. Right, right. We, we sort of talk obliquely about the Mackenzie Papineau Battalion. I mean, most of them were, were communists. There's that kind of effort to recognize them as veterans as well. Was there a community within Montreal then that would have, that, that Bethune would have been a part of to help mobilize elements of that, uh, of that organization to go to Spain? Oh yes, uh, many of the people who attended that 1979 conference that I referred to uh, were activists in Montreal after Bethune left and would have been involved in trying to recruit for the Mac Paps. I should be clear, there are, is no Mackenzie Papineau Battalion in October 1936. It's something that emerges <laughs> during the winter of 36, 37 and then uh, begins to come into existence in, uh, in 1937, 38. Um, before, like the rest of the International Brigade, it has to come home. Um, the, uh, the activists in Montreal were overwhelmingly drawn from the Anglo-Protestant upper class, McGill professoriate, and a part of the Jewish community. Uh, there were a few French Canadians who people list as part of the process, Raoul Trepanier, who was the president of the Montreal Trades and Labor Council, at least in 1936-37, uh, could be persuaded to support the Republic. Uh, how much this meant, I have not yet been able to discover, and certainly uh, French-Canadian public support for uh, the Republic is, after 1936, early 37, confined to one very important, Important, I'm exaggerating, but is largely confined to one very important figure, um, the owner editor of Le Jour, who um, was able to, um, and why his name is slipping my mind after all these years, I don't remember, but I'll think of it as Jean, Jean Charles Harvé. Um, Jean Charles Harvé uh, was involved in um, an invitation extended to André Malraux. Uh, the author of La Condition Humaine, The Human Condition, who had flown as a fighter pilot for the Republic and who was in North America on a fundraising tour. And uh, Arve was an author and the English Canadian organizers of Melrose tour um, asked uh, Arve and other French Canadian literary figures to attend a reception for Mauro on the basis of their common interest in literature. Uh, Harvey was attacked so strenuously uh, by uh, whatever you want to call it, the Catholics by the press uh, for having participated in something resembling Malraux's attempt to raise money for the Spanish Republic. that he seems to have converted because his newspaper, Le Jour, um, became um, the most, most dynamically pro-Republican newspaper, English or French in the city. And indeed, Le Jour published the reports of a very pro-Republican columnist uh, who uh, provided Le Jour with weekly reports, especially in uh, 1937 and early 1938, uh, if you will, building the case for the Republican cause. So as always, it's complex. Lots of work has to be done. I'm interested in the fine grain of all these issues before I offer very sweeping conclusions. I've got two more questions here. Um, in, in some ways, I'm, I'm paraphrasing a little bit for this. Uh, you're saying that while both these questions have to do with Bethune's reputation uh, and how it's resurrected in a, in a early 1970s, um, Kevin Spooner is raising the point as to whether or not this is the resurrection of, uh, of, of Bethune and Bethune House purchased by external, as you said, is part of a, a form of, of diplomacy uh, to try to increase and to uh, improve uh, uh, Canadian-Chinese relations. Uh, before I answer that, I should say Mark Humphreys thinks that the Canadian government bought the, uh, the Bethune House in Gravenhurst, his hometown, to give him summer employment, which it did. 
But more seriously, uh, I, think that, uh, I, I think that uh, that it started as political diplomacy. It started as an attempt to use the only thing we had, the only card, if you will, we had, uh, which could link Canada and China in a highly friendly and, if you will, highly favorable manner. And I think Trudeau, the Department of External Affairs, Paul Lin, other people used Bethune uh, consciously, and I'm not criticizing them for it, uh, to promote um, Canadian-Chinese relationships. Now, once Bethune was, if you will, resurrected or made into a public figure in the early 1970s, authors and historians and journalists and filmmakers uh, knew about him, learned about him, were fascinated by, them, by him, and perfectly legitimately wrote books about him, books of very good quality, admittedly, but uh, there's nothing wrong with discovering an individual from the past and bringing him to the fore. I wish historians who choose to ask a, a linear question like that of the past would at the minimum give some kind of reference to the context in which the person lived rather than largely accepting their particular version of events uh, as the core the extent of the story. So that might your that answer might be directed towards this that last question. I think we'll wrap things up a little bit, but it's the question about how the resurrection of Bethune as a humanitarian tends to ignore the politics of the 30s. And and if I understand the question properly, it, it's you know fact that if we take his politics in the 30s seriously, uh, you're saying he's kind of ignored in, in the life of Montreal in the 30s. So does it, what does that tell us about Canada, Montreal in the 30s? Well, um, it tells us that Beth Hume was a fairly minor figure in Montreal of interest to people interested in the medical history of uh, work against tuberculosis. Um, and people interested in the Communist Party. In the collection of essays from the 1979 conference, there are also sections on Bethune as an artist, Bethune as an individual who taught art classes or organized art classes for young children. Bethune also um, ran a, um, a free medical clinic in Verdun for a while. I mean, I, I, nothing that I'm trying to say is intended to take anything away from Bethune. He was, mm -hmm. however, a remarkable, unusual individual uh, who, uh, whose impact upon his own society or Spain. Um, I hesitate to say anything about China because I think Mao's essay immortalized for the Chinese uh, uh, Bethune and there's no coming back from that. Um, one of the things that is remarkable is how little time Bethune actually spent in Spain, about four months, four and a half months. And even in China, he was there for a little more than a year and, uh, in a fairly isolated part of China. So the transformation of Bethune into a Chinese national hero is in many ways a deliberate political act, as is the uh, transformation of Bethune in the 1970s. Right, right. One final comment there, Leo DeVos mentions about, uh, again, to reinforce your idea about the complexity of these kinds of stories, how the friends of the Quakers uh, were supplying uh, the Chinese in the jungles of Burma, a story that's really yet to be told outside of the friends. So uh, yeah. again, I think these are all stories that we're all starting to learn a little bit. And and your discussion here, I think, has uh, piqued our interest as it always has. So Terry, thank you again. And uh, uh, thank again the organizers who I will pass things over to right now to wrap things up. I should just say that I'll make my final point that of course we're gonna hear from Terry again on Wednesday as we begin our webinar in uh, cooperation with the, uh, uh, the Juno Beach Center and the Greg Center and of course the Canadian Battlefields Foundation. But I think all of our listeners are probably setting up their times to uh, to register for that event on Wednesday night. Over to you guys, thank you. 
Uh, thank you, uh, Jeff, and thank you, Terry, for your wonderful talk. Um, we just have a couple of closing remarks and some thank yous just before we let you go. Yeah. Um, well, first off, like, like Jeff just mentioned, if you enjoyed the last few days and want to see more, visit canadianmilitaryhistory.ca slash webinar to sign up for the Suburb webinar series, which is called Maple Leaf Route. And that actually kicks off on Wednesday with a talk by Terry about Juno Beach. Um, and now, uh, if you'll indulge me for a moment, we have uh, quite a few people to thank, uh, starting with the Laurier staff here, um, especially the essential personnel who've been on campus the entire pandemic, while the rest of us ride it out from our basements, spare rooms, or wherever we've managed to carve out a home workspace. Um, thank you especially to Joan Leach in the Faculty of Arts, who allowed Brittany and I to set up uh, dual mission controls on opposite sides of the office so we could host everything from a good, reliable, wired, high-speed internet connection. Thank you to all the university presses, that's UBC, WLU, University of Toronto, and Cambridge University Press for offering discounts on select titles to our attendees. I'd like to thank Eric Story for helping Brittany and I get acquainted with Zoom webinars and Kyle Pritchard for coordinating all aspects of the CP Stacy Award, uh, which we are thrilled to now have a part of the colloquium and uh, is going to become a, a great tradition here, I believe. Thank you to Kyle Falcon and Raluca Obrian for advertising and promoting the colloquium on our social media channels in the lead up to the event and even throughout today and yesterday. Uh, thank you also to Kyle Falcon for stepping up as an emergency chair. That is much appreciated. Yes, and thank you to um, all of our presenters for all your hard work, uh, not only in prepping your papers, which we know um, can be stressful as it is, um, but also for practicing with us, you know, behind the scenes to get all the technical requirements working and all the cues down pat, um, so that when your panel went live, um, there was nothing, no technical issues to distract from your excellent work. Um, and thank you also to our panel chairs, as well as the moderators for our plenary and keynotes, uh, who did great jobs of uh, adapting to a uh, webinar platform, which they're probably not too used to. Um, you did a great job of keeping the event running smoothly and fostering the great discussion that um, our conference has become known for. Thank you to our plenaries, Jonathan Vance and Terry Kopp, for bookending our event uh, with lectures based actually in their respective hometowns. Um, and to Jonathan Fennell, um, who graciously agreed to address us virtually after last year's colloquium um, and his scheduled keynote were, um, you know, abruptly and unceremoniously canceled as most things were in spring 2020. Uh, thank you, um, Dr. Fennell, for um, uh, presenting with us. I'd like to also thank uh, our boss, Kevin Spooner, who has been an absolute joy to work with as director of the LCMSDS since he took over from Mark Humphreys almost a year ago. It's hard to believe, Kevin, that our entire working relationship has so far been virtual. Um, I know everyone at the center is excited for the day when instead of jumping on Zoom to ask you a question, we can just holler it through the walls like we used to. Uh, thank you to my co-organizer, Brittany, who is utterly dependable and every bit as responsible as myself for the success of this year's colloquium. Shifting online represented a steep learning curve for both of us, and we really could not be more pleased with how well it turned out. Lastly, thank you to everyone in the audience for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed seeing colleagues, learned something new, and generally had a good time. We hope dearly to see you in person in Waterloo next year. Until then, take care of yourselves. Have a great rest of your day. Bye. Thank you, everyone.